there's an old saying that goes, predicting the future is easy. Getting it right is the hard part. I think there's a world market for five computers. That was Thomas Watson, president of IBM in 1943. Remote shopping, while technically feasible, will be a flop. That was Time magazine in 1966. iPhone, I don't think, will gain any significant market share. That was Steve Ballmer, CEO of Microsoft in 2007. In 2014, 308 million PCs were shipped. Remote shopping has taken many forms, the latest being e-commerce and m-commerce. The retail e-commerce industry is valued at 840 billion in 2014. iPhone, at its peak, had a market share of 23%. If the industry stalwarts didn't get it right, who am I to predict what the future holds? Rather than trying to gaze through the crystal ball and tell you what it is in the future, I thought let me share some insight on how best you can prepare yourself, not merely to survive, but to ace and thrive in the future. Great. So before I start into my speech, my speech is divided into three sections. The first part of my speech is three stories about people and companies. The second part is what key messages are we going to deduce from these three stories. The third part is how are we going to take these messages and apply to our current and future challenges. So the first story takes you back to the 20th century. An adventurous explorer by the name Sir Ernest Shackleton took up a mission, an imperial trans-Antarctic expedition of 1914. Let me show you a short video of that. Surrounded by immense ice flows, gripped by perpetual cold, no place on Earth is more hostile to life than Antarctica. As forbidding as a distant planet, it was the last continent reached by explorers. Shackleton attempted to reach the South Pole twice, only to have it claimed first by others. He set his sights on a new dream to be the first explorer to cross the entire Antarctic continent on foot. A six-man sledging party would travel across the vast and inhospitable continent, charting its unknown regions. During the 1,500-mile journey, they would survive partly on supplies cached in advance. The endurance would approach Antarctica from the unknown and ice-laden waters of the Weddell Sea. He is said to have posted an unusual recruitment notice. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success, Ernest Shackleton. How many of you would have responded to that advert? At least I just, this is a honest audience. I didn't have all the hands going up. Good. If you hear what they went through and what eventually happened, I'm sure even those two hands would be down. Antarctic, the coldest, windiest, and the highest of continents. Sun rises and sets once a year. Six months of daylight and six months of darkness. The highest temperature in summer is minus 20 degrees. The winter temperature hits minus 60 degrees. What do you think would have happened to Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew 
who were on the ship called Endurance. So let me tell you, right from the start, one after the other disaster struck Endurance. The ship got stuck in ice, eventually got crushed, leading them onto a drifting ice floe. And the drifting ice floe took them to such a remote corner of the world where they could never be rescued by anyone from outside. So, do you think they survived? In uncertainty, all the 28 crew members survived. And you know for how long? More than 500 days. That's the record of any human being on Antarctica till date from the 1914. So they got rescued somewhere in the 1916. And that was because Sir Ernest Shackleton changed his goals. He was bold the minute he realized reaching his goal for what he started the expedition was impossible. He changed his goals. He was courageous to swallow his pride because he, remember, he got defeated twice earlier. This was his third attempt. But then his goal changed to rescue of his crew and safety of them. And he single-handedly led them kept them active through those darkness, through those minus 60 degrees for 500 days and he didn't lose a single man. That's courage, that's boldness, and that's visionary leadership of changing goals. Now, moving from the 20th century to the 21st, a company which is 18 years old, what's popularly called as Google, was initially, the search engine was called Background by Page and Bread. It was a simple engine. It was to index the world information and make it accessible and useful for the whole world. Google is valued today at $527 billion. Did their goal anyway read advertising? Their single, the lion's share of the revenue comes from advertising. And today they're working on driverless cars, they're working on a tune project, they're working on natural language synthesis, a whole bunch of things that are nowhere closely related to where the money is coming from. That's because they're always looking for the next big thing, innovating, even without knowing whether it has a use or not but thinking beyond the box, thinking beyond the realms of certainty. Moving to the third story. How many of you know Kodak? Surprising. I thought that was pre your era. Nokia, that was your era. And the demise was in your era. Kodak and Nokia are very similar. They were front runners in their industry. They were innovating. They were great. They were so synonymous that you had a Kodak moment, which meant a memorable picture. And when you said mobile phones, it was Nokia. Did you know that Kodak Research Laboratories was the first to invent the first digital camera in 1975? But they didn't pursue it. Nokia missed the whole trend on smartphones and today they are non-existent. Both of these companies have vanished into thin air. Whether it was Shackleton who took a bold, courageous decision to abandon the ship and start the rescue mission, whether it was Google founders who are constantly on the lookout for the next innovation, the next big thing, or Kodak and Nokia who failed to adapt themselves to the changing dynamic market conditions. It's all there. Being bold, innovative, and adaptive. So those are the three key ingredients for the youth of today and the leaders of tomorrow. If you want to ace and thrive, these are the aspects that you will have to have in your heart and bear on your chest. 
So how does this translate into the current challenges and into the future challenges? Three global challenges that I would like to highlight. Two which are very relevant to you. The third one, I'll try to make it relevant. Climatic change, economic turmoil. You can correlate this. You see the drastic changes in the weather. You look at the, you experienced the rain in Doha yesterday. Look at the extreme weather conditions. Rising sea levels, the snows melting, the ice packs melting. Haven't you experienced climate change? So what are you going to do about it? Brace yourself. That's the new reality. There's no escaping it. The first thing is accept that reality and now start adapting yourself. How do I design my cities? How do I design my infrastructure? How do I design my life around these changing climatic conditions? That's one part. How do I innovate and try and arrest this climate change? How do I make it sustainable for humans to inhabit it, this planet? The accuracy level of predictions from the 1980s to the current day has increased a lot. You have predictable engines which tell you how the weather is evolving by the second. But how many people have access to the smartphones, smartphones and internet connections? Just 3.2 billion people out of the 7.2. So how can you take this information and this power of technology to the rest of the people who don't even have access to any of those smart technologies? That's something that you can work on. That's something that you can innovate. Because they do need to live on this planet. Whether it's Facebook or Google or others trying to connect the next billion, how can you take this information and the advancement to them, even if they are not connected? Economic turmoil, <coughs> unemployment rates, demand supply fluctuations, human capital and financial capitals not reaching the underdeveloped world. How can you innovate? How can you make human capital and financial capital accessible to the developed, developing and the undeveloped world? Lies in your hands. How do you think out of the box? How do you make the underdeveloped markets adapt themselves to compete against the developed markets? Ideas out there to be exploited. The third global challenge, which you are not directly impacted by, but is a serious challenge. And it's a shame in the 21st century. So let me play this video and then come back to you on what it is. According to believers in overpopulation, there are so many of us on the planet that food production cannot possibly keep up. However, according to both the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Food Program, there is currently enough food on the planet for everyone to be well fed. Not only that, but we're growing this food on less land than we did in the past. This is why in the United States, for example, the government can afford to pay farmers not to grow food, but instead return their farmland to the wild. Modern technology also allows us to grow food on land where it would have been impossible to do so, even a few years ago. Agricultural experts even believe that Africa, if cultivated using modern farming methods, could eventually feed the whole world, all by itself. Then why are people in many parts of the world starving? The World Food Program lists key causes of hunger and overpopulation is not on that list. War, one of the leading causes of world hunger, destroys crops and disrupts relief efforts. Widespread poverty prevents many from buying the food that they need. And a lack of infrastructure means that there isn't a reliable way to transport food to areas that need it. This is why reducing the number of hungry people will not make the remaining people less hungry. Those who have access to the food will continue to have access to it, and those who don't will still be hungry. Reducing population will not magically cause food to be spread around equally. And blaming overpopulation for everything does nothing but distract us from the real problems that we actually have. Think about it. Isn't it a shame 
in the 21st century, you have 800 million people who go to bed without a single meal. You have 750 million people who don't have access to drinking water. That's the world that you're going to inherit. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to innovate to make it accessible? If human brilliance has created Google, Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, which are merely platforms connecting the demand and supply, why not create a platform when you have enough food in this world to feed all those hungry souls out there? These are the challenges that you will be facing in the future. We are facing it currently. We perhaps didn't do a great job. We are hoping we will do much better than where we are now. Challenges are what make life interesting. Overcoming them makes life meaningful. The youth of today, the leaders of tomorrow, as you pave your way through the uncharted territories of the future, be bold in facing things. Be innovative and adaptive. That's what will help you ace and thrive. I don't think the uncertainties are going to change. But what I definitely know, and you will certainly want to lead, is a meaningful life. Thank you.